So I'm going to be the MC for the afternoon segment here. Uh, my name is Cooper Levy Baker. Uh, I've been a food reporter with the Sarasota Herald Tribune for a few years uh, and have had a chance to meet a lot of the people in this room and, and uh, get to know some of the amazing work that's being done in Sarasota County. Uh, it's a very exciting time, I think, to be passionate about uh, local food and sustainability and um, a ton of other issues that are you guys are chatting about right now, probably. Uh, so. I'm going to be the MC this afternoon, um, and first of all, I would like to introduce the uh, mayor of the city of Sarasota, uh, Mayor Willie Shaw. <laughs> he is presently in his second term as the District 1 Commissioner and in his second term as the mayor of the city of Sarasota. He's a native of Sarasota where his family has had a history for over 110 years. He's a Vietnam era veteran, uh, having served four years in the United States Air Force. He's retired from the U.S. Postal Service and is an associate minister at the Mount Tabor Missionary Baptist Church and is the father of nine children. His wife, Juanita, is presently a palliative care chaplain. The mayor and his wife enjoy family very much and the quality of life uh, that Sarasota offers. So without further ado, Mayor Shaw. I thank you so very much for this opportunity. I am uh, <clears throat> indeed very grateful, I am honored, and it is my pleasure. Whenever we are able to um, put Sarasota on the forefront, it, it makes it that much better. I want to thank the County of Sarasota for leading this effort, and again, all of you for attending. Would you look at somebody and tell them you look good? Go ahead. It's okay, it's okay. Normally they don't do that in these settings and everybody's kind of quiet and waiting for the punchline. I don't have any, so let's move on. The city is a proud partner of this 10th Annual Sustainable Communities Workshop and we look forward to continuing to work in partnership to make sure our community and region is a sustainable one. In the city, we're seeing unprecedented growth because it's a wonderful place to live. And I can say that again, it's a wonderful place to live. Anyone coming to Sarasota will come again. If you have just gotten here, believe me, you will come back to Sarasota. You will either drink the water, breathe the fresh air, or catch one of God's most beautiful sunsets out on Lido. Yes, there's siesta, but the city, the city offers Lido. <laughs> uh, our growth, we're, we're looking at another thousand uh, hotel rooms in, in downtown Sarasota this year, within the year. And then another thousand condos. So uh, this workshop and, and, and what you're doing here is most important. We're going to be growing outward, but we also have to look at sustaining what we have inward. One of the areas that most concerns me besides all of the interests that you may have is our social equity. How are we going to get along? How do we sustain this beautiful um, paradise that we call Sarasota? If we don't recognize and express our differences, learn to live within them, learn to live with them. The exercise I gave you, telling somebody how good they look, that's all a part of making this what it is. I'm very proud to be of Sarasota. I went to the military supporting and defending Sarasota. My family, again, has been here over 110 years. Uh, my great-grandfathers and his brothers uh, brought uh, the Seaboard Railroad in here and laid, they were Gandhi dancers. They built the beds and kept and maintained the tracks. The city's doing a lot to tackle sustainability. We're making our streets more walkable. Change is not always what you want it to be, but change is what's gonna be. And you can either be a part of it or be run over by it. 
that's change. We're investing in our bike lanes. We are protecting our tree canopy. There are some of the most beautiful lanes here that are so well hidden through our tree canopies. You can ride and, and, and never even see anything but the glimmer of sunlight beaming through the leaves. Sarasota has had a great work on revitalizing our bay. That's something I want my four-year-old grandson to be a part of. That's a part of the legacy I want to leave. That's what we are all about in sustaining this area. We are doing more in redeveloping our brownfields. Not everything we did 55 years ago or 60 years ago looked towards our future or today. Seeing it, recognizing it, and being able to rectify it has been a great challenge for the city of Sarasota. But we got it done. Thank you. And we're starting to seriously think about climate change. There's a lot to say about climate change, and there's a lot of controversy on yay or nay. Be that as it may, there will be a tomorrow, and what we do to preserve it will rely upon each and every one of us here. We are also working on a form-based code. A form-based code is good for sustainability. It takes the separateness us out of our built environments, separating retail from our homes and affordable housing and, and, and this. These are all things that we're going to have to look forward to. Your workshop here today is most, most important. You can remember it for its fondness, the beautiful people that you have met here, the conversations that you've had. But l unless we adapt what you talk about here today, we will come back next year and the year after and the year after and the year after and the year after, and we won't have done anything more than have a conversation. Thank you again for making this the place of your 10th Annual uh, Sustainability Workshop. On behalf of the City of Sarasota, Welcome, enjoy your day, and for those of you from here, continue to make Sarasota the place we want to be and live. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you so much, Mayor Shaw, for your comments and for all the efforts of the city of Sarasota. Um, our keynote speaker this afternoon is John Thaxton. Uh, his presentation is titled, Planning for a Sustainable Future, a Local Perspective. I would just like to remind you as John speaks, I'm gonna introduce John in a sec, but these cards, these are really important as, you know, kind of you're listening to John and thinking of things that you want to ask and follow up on, jot down some notes, jot down some questions, and we'll take questions afterwards. Uh, so, um, John Thaxon joined the Gulf Coast Community F Foundation staff as the Director of Community Investment in September 2012, uh, while completing his 12th year serving on the Sarasota County Commission. He joined the foundation full-time when his commission term ended in November 2012. In his role with the foundation, John works with nonprofit organizations, donors, and other community partners to invest Gulf Coast grants and resources in projects that will transform our region and improve public policies. He currently leads Gulf Coast's Feeding Hungry Families Initiative, an unprecedented effort to transform our region's charitable hunger relief system. His knowledge of the Gulf Coast region and the relationships that he built as a public servant are tremendous assets to this work. Before and during his career in elected office, John earned great respect for crossing traditional boundaries and listening to all sides of an issue before making a decision. His active involvement in both business and environmental issues have ultimately contributed to his first successful campaign for the Sarasota County Commission in 2000 and his re-election in 2004 and 2008. He's a fourth generation Floridian born near Osprey and he's recognized throughout Florida as a leading advocate for protecting the natural environment. 
He's an acknowledged leader in growth management, environmental preservation, water conservation, and transportation planning. His commission appointments included the Metropolitan Planning Organization, the Minnesota Water Supply Authority, and the National Association of Counties Growth and Land Use Committee. He's been awarded the 1,000 Friends of Florida State Growth Management Award and was twice named the Nature Conservancy's Grassroots Activist of the Year. In 1996, he was featured in National Geographic for his work in preserving endangered species. Please give a warm welcome to John Thaxton. Thank you, Cooper. I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me in the in the back. Um, all right, we, all right, cool. It's sometimes being removed from the microphone and being cursed with this height is not a good thing. Thank you, Cooper. I appreciate all the work that you do. I love reading your articles. You're, you're a breath of fresh air in the Sarasota media market. I, I just you add a touch of personalism that, that I really appreciate. I'm going to real quick um, tell you what I'm going to talk about. That way, if I fail to deliver, at least you know what I tried to accomplish. Um, I, have a, I have a half an hour. I'm going to cover three topics with you, and then we're going to leave uh, 10 minutes at the end for question and answers. I was instructed to do something inspirational, and I've never really, you know, that's kind of a high bar to, to, to hit. And it was somewhat intimidating. Um, for me, as I gathered my thoughts on, on what to, uh, to talk about in terms of sustainability. So I picked three different topic areas. One of them has to do with our marine environment and our blue economy. Another one has to do with uh, Sarasota County's housing. And then the third one, I guess it really wouldn't be much of a John Thaxton talk if I didn't talk a little bit about threatened and endangered landscapes of the community and our um, obligation to, to preserve them. So without, um, um, without beating around the bush anymore, let me get to my first topic, and this one is, is the blue economy. Um, Cooper described my role as the uh, senior vice president, uh, first vice president of the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, and one of the roles of that is to manage a project that we call uh, the Gulf Coast Challenge. And the, the challenge this year was centered around marine ecology and how we can take this asset that we all enjoy from an aesthetic point of view and turn it into a sustainable economic engine that would bring jobs and um, other, other sorts of um, opportunities for employment into our community while not only maintaining the environment but actually improving it. And so the winner of the of this year's prize. It's a $375,000 prize. It's actually $400,000. So it's, it's, it's getting pretty close to some serious money um, and did in fact attract um, applicants from all over the country. This year's winter, winner, um, interestingly enough, concentrated uh, their efforts on the gray striped mullet which is the mullet that is abundant in our waterways. And I don't want you to do it now if you brought your iPads with you, but when you go home tonight, I want you to bring up Google Earth or Bing Maps or whatever it is that you use, find Sarasota Square Mall, and then go due west of Sarasota Square Mall. You'll find a, mu a new museum on the Elling Eyed property. And then if you look at that coastline, you'll see this really funky looking curvilinear jetty that goes out into the bay. And it actually forms a, a lake now. Uh, that was man-made. It was made by aboriginals in excess of a 1,000 years ago. And what the aboriginals discovered was that in their dugout canoes, they could make enough racket and noise to corral these huge schools of gray striped mullet in through this little gated impoundment that they created with these oyster and other bivalve clam sh uh, shells. And then when the mullet were there, they would shut the gate and they would have mullet year round. And they ate every single piece of this mullet. As most Aboriginal cultures, there was nothing that, that went to, to waste. Um, obviously, all of our uh, Calusan friends have, have died out. They died out many, many, many years ago. And the next group to come into this area was the, um, uh, the Europeans. And they, too, recognized the value of this gray-striped 
mullet. And Sarasota County used to be dotted, the entire coastline used to be dotted with these small fish camps. About the only one that remains now is the one up in Cortez. I grew up in Osprey, which is in central Sarasota County. For those of you that are uh, uh, geographically impaired, it's not South County, it's Central County. And there were five or six fish houses right along um, I area. So I grew up in these small mullet skiffs harvesting, um, harvesting the mullet. And I can tell you, when we ate the mullet at our house, again, virtually every piece of the fish was, was used. We, uh, we filleted it, we ate the roe, the remnant of the fish was used to fertilize our citrus trees where we dug the trench. But that was then. Um, today is completely different. We had the commercial fishing industry go under, partly because of their inability to self-regulate, partly because of the government's failure to regulate the industry. The voters took the regulatory powers into their own hands, and the industry for shut, was shut down for better, for worse. I'll, I'll leave that to your personal opinion. But today the stocks have, have rebounded, and they've rebounded um, considerably. But the problem is how we're fishing the mullet today. We have a three, uh, about, a, about a two month season where fishermen from all over the world come to the Gulf Coast and they harvest these fish. Upwards of 20 million pounds of mullet are harvested um, in, in, in our, our Gulf Coast region every year. But they take the yellow row out of the female and then they throw the rest of the fish away, by and large. All of the males that are caught, and of course they're killed pretty much when they're caught, are also thrown away. And many times, you, we will get calls at the call center at the county. I say we, I'm no longer a we. They get, let me fix my pronouns here, they get calls at the call center of these red tide outbreaks. They're not red tide. It's just that the fish kills because of the bycatch of this abusive fishing behavior of the gray striped mullet is so severe all these mullet back up in the canals and start smelling and it becomes a big challenge. So this industry, um, Healthy Earth is their name, um, it's a conglomeration of, of about nine different firms including Mode and Ed Charles's restaurants and uh, a group of others that, that are in the, um, the, the fisheries industry. They have this proposal where they are going to retrain and retool the fishermen because one of the reasons that mullet is not a palatable food to many of us is because they don't treat it right when they first catch it. You have to, um, not to be, get gory or whatever, but you have to break the neck and bleed the mullet immediately after you catch it and then put it in ice water in order for the flesh to be really table ready uh, uh, for, a, for a restaurant. So they're going to re um, teach the fishermen on, on how, to, how to fish it. And as a result, they're going to be selling then multiple products. Uh, one of the premier products that they use now is something called Botarga. Um, anyone here familiar with Botarga? Any gourmet cooks? All right. And so what that is, is we take the yellow row and we sell it to Asia for about 10 bucks a pound. And then the Asian countries dry it in, in an old way. And then they resell it back to us for $100 a pound. And, and that's the market. Um, seems kind of foolish. It's, it, there's no trick. There, you know, the sun is the same here as it is in Asia, and we can do the same clay pots and everything. So what this industry is going to do is they're going to create the botarga, botarga here and sell it. They are going to harvest the omega-3 oils that the mullet is, is, um, is really rich with. They are going to use much of the by, byproduct for fertilizer, and they will also create a fish meal that can be then sold all over the world in aquaculture and other uh, fish farm activities. This will employ a lot of people other than just the fish. It will be the construction of, of a, a large warehousing and processing plant. And they believe that they can take this 20 million plus pounds of mullet that are presently being harvested and potentially sustainable and reintroduce it into the market, provide for not only a healthy economy, but also for a healthy bay. Um, and just for those of you, and I know many of you are in the room are familiar with the MBAQ um, uh, qualification for um, um, for seafood. Uh, seafood watch is what it's commonly known as. Uh, the gray striped mullet is considered a best choice. There, it is literally in the highest category of a sustainable, harvestable resource. Um, so that, that was the Gulf Coast um, prize. Um, look 
for more details as, as, as the implementation occurs. But I thought it was a really um, cool example that brings not only, I, I, I love the study of history and I love the study of archaeology and it's so interesting that in this modern age of technology we have finally come back to a sustainable way of thinking that has existed in situ in this area for over a thousand years. It just, we just forgot about it for a little while. The second topic that I wanted to talk about is, is, is land preservation. Um, this is something that's obviously very um, near and dear to, to my heart. I did um, my first land acquisition work in the, um, the mid-70s and kind of tinkered around with it a little bit until I ran into this most fabu fabulous, inspirational person called uh, John O. Miller, and he just totally changed the way that I looked at the environment and, and land acquisition. Um, I know earlier there was some discussion, I heard a, dis a discussion about agriculture. Many of us oftentimes view agriculture as the enemy to uh, land preservation and ecology. Um, they do have their faults, I'll be the, the first to admit that, but I would also offer to you that there has been no piece of environmentally sensitive land that has been purchased in Sarasota County in the last 50 years that was not directly preserved as the result of some sort of agricultural practice. If they were not there being stewards of the land, keeping the habitats relatively intact, then they would not be there at all. So I, I always, anytime I talk about land preservation, I always tip my hat to the early um, interests, um, agricultural interests in Sarasota County, because were it not for their passion and their love for the natural land, it would not be there for us to make a conscious choice as to whether or not to preserve it or not. And I want to come back to that in, in just a moment. But the county has also enjoyed a great deal of success from many of you in the room working on referendums. We've done, I think, seven referendums in the last 25 or 30 years, and only one has failed. The last one that passed was deemed to never, you know, they, we were told it could never pass. It's a <laughs> anti-tax environment, you know, all the, um, uh, the, the right-wing rhetoric was, was in, its, in its glory. Um, it passed in Sarasota County with a four-to-one margin, unheard of. It just, it just rocked the socks off of ecologists around the southeastern United States. Um, we've now preserved, as many of you know, 100 and plus thousand acres of continuous wildlands in Sarasota County. It is now the largest identifiable feature from outer space in in this in, in Sarasota County. It's bigger than Sarasota Bay. It's bigger than the the developments. As a matter of fact, I was looking at a, a photograph taken by one of the astronauts um, out of the space shuttle um, when one of their last voyages were happening. And there was this Mayaka Island just in all of its splendor and glory. But the work is not over yet. I think, um, as you were instructed a little bit earlier, in the day we have a couple remarkable opportunities that are very time sensitive that need to be acted upon and they need to be acted upon um, now. The, they're just simply not going to be around for, for quite a while. I'm often asked the question by folks, in, by my very good friends in the development industry and by my very good friends in the government industry, um, a third of Sarasota County's total land mass is preserved. When is enough enough? And I think that's a legitimate question. Um, and as I pondered that question and, and give it thought on how do I respond to these folks in a way that they can understand it and they can comprehend it, I say, well, <clears throat> would you not agree that our greenscapes, our rivers, our, all be them man-made lakes, we have no natural lakes, but we do have lakes. I don't tell them that. I just let them think that it's a natural thing. Um, but our rivers and our lakes and our coastlines, would you not agree that they are important assets to, the, to this community? And the answer is yes. Would you not also agree that they, in fact, act as infrastructure by cleaning our air and cleaning our water, providing for social and recreational and spiritual um, um, development and things like that? And they said yes. So as long as they say yes to those two questions, I got them. Because the next question is, okay, so when do we stop building the rest of the infrastructure? When do we stop building shopping malls? When do we stop building sewage treatment plants? When do we stop building roads? When do, why are you only asking me, why do we only stop with this one infrastructure? And, and they'll think about it for a little while, but before I give them a, a, another chance to respond, I say, and what about houses? 
Sarasota County's cumulative comprehensive plans that if you were to take the four municipalities in Sarasota County and assess a minimum to a low capacity of those collective comprehensive plans, you have enough development already approved in those to double the 400,000 people that are here today. So I ask them, when does that stop? Well, you know, when do we stop that? And so the moral of the story is we don't stop preserving the natural landscapes that, that we were entrusted to preserve until you stop. As long as you're going to go, we're going to go and try to balance this, this thing out. But here's, it, it's a little bit, I would not, this is why I struggle with this aspirational or this, you know, thing. Because some of this does not necessarily make you feel good when you, when you think about it. But here's the way that I would frame the immediacy of us acting on these last few parcels of natural landscapes in Sarasota County. And I mean natural landscapes. I'm not, it, it matters to me not whether you are a creationalist or you are an evolutionist. It doesn't matter. The, the argument works beautifully the same way. I mean, if either nature created it and it's special because of that, or God created it and it's special because of that, or any hybrid that you want to put in, in there, the argument works marvelously well um, either way. We know that the first human habitants, the best that we know, the first human habitants in this area that we now know is Sarasota County was about 10,000 years ago during the Paleo time. We have evidence of that in Little Salt Springs down in the North Port area. We also, as I mentioned earlier, know that there were inhabitants here, the Calusans, who had these really remarkable settlements. Um, <coughs> Europeans have been here for several hundred years. So I never counted how many generations of humans have been in this regional area that we call Sarasota, this defined area that we call Sarasota County. But it's very safe to say that every single generation up till now that has lived in Sarasota County could have had, whether they did or not is irrelevant, but they could have had a conscious decision as to whether or not they are going to preserve this natural landscape or whether or not they are going to convert it for some human, direct human use. The sad part is, is that the people in this room are the last generation that will ever have that choice. We are now to the point where the larger parcels of natural landscape in Sarasota County, within the next 15 to 20 years, possibly within the next five to 10 years, they will either be preserved or the opportunity to preserve them will be lost forever, period. I, I, I'm, I'm totally confident of that. If anybody wants to challenge that, and many have, I've, I've, I've made that statement numerous times, I'll sit you down, I'll show you an aerial photograph, I will show you the ownership patterns, and I'll show you where that property is going. We've got about five or ten years on these last few remaining parcels, and it's the people in this room that are going to make the difference as to whether or not those parcels are preserved or those parcels are lost. Your grandchildren are not going to have that choice nor are their grandchildren or their grandchildren. This is the last shot that we have at it in Sarasota County for the preservations. So if that does not motivate you to want to go out and, and really actively you know, talk to these elected officials and talk to these folks about this is, we don't have to worry about when is enough enough. We know when is enough enough because we're at the tail end of it. We can identify the last two, three, or four parcels of significant size, meaning over 100 or so acres, and then it is over. And we have the money to do it. And we can do it today, and if we don't do it today, it's not gonna happen. I'm gonna take my last few minutes to talk about an issue of sustainability that, dare I say, I'll, I'll, I'll say it right up front, I was gonna say it at the end, um, but I think in terms of sustainable communities, um, our pressure for an adequate supply of housing that will safely provide domiciles for our workforce is the most significant sustainable issue facing this community. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Um, if you're not aware of my history, I grew up, I'm a third generation, I'm actually a 
uh, fifth or sixth generation Floridian, fourth generation Sarasota, and I'm a third generation real estate broker in Sarasota County. My grandfather sold real estate. My great grandfather actually built homes in Sarasota. My grandfather sold real estate. My father worked for what was at the time the largest um, residential developer in all of Sarasota County. They now don't do much. It was called Paver Construction um, at the time. So I got my license when I was 18. And at 19, I was the youngest real estate broker in the entire state of Florida. Um, so I only tell you that um, I, I did not leave the real estate industry until I was elected to office. So it's very near and dear to my heart. I respect those that are. Um, that, that sell real estate. I respect those that develop real estate. I don't speak ill of them. Um, but Sarasota's real estate market is dramatically different today than what it once was. I remember when I was 19 and 20, and even when I was a child working with my father, um, they were developing a subdivision called Paver Park. Um, many of you know where it is. It's up off of 27th East. Uh, 27th Street. And at the, also at that time, there were other subdivisions going in, such as Brentwood Estates, Sarasota Springs. Um, I can go on and on and on and on and on. And there were also a lot of uh, very small villas and apartment buildings that you see now along Bee Ridge Road and Siesta Drive, and, and they're all over the place. Um, that was kind of the norm. And at the same time, they were also building luxury homes along the Bayfront and in these other subdivisions. So there was this chance for a person who was working at a restaurant or just starting his or her career where they could either buy or rent this smaller unit and begin to build equity and work their way up in that housing market. And that was actually my specialty. I worked with FHA and VA buyers when I was first in real estate. And nothing made me feel better than finding these affordable units and coming back to these people in 10 years or five years and saying, hey, let's sell it. I'll put 50,000 bucks in your park and you're going to move up. Um, and, and it was really cool. It, it just, I, I, I loved doing it at the time. But it stopped. About 20 years ago, it stopped. We stopped building small, affordable housings. We stopped building apartment buildings. We stopped building rental properties. But at the same time, the demand, and I use the term demand. Some people like to say, well, it's, it's, it's not a demand. It's, 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 it's more of a need. BS. It's a demand. There is a demand for this real estate market that has steadily increased, but the supply has, has remained totally, totally stagnant. And again, why does that happen? It happens because we do live in a free market, um, enterprise-driven um, culture, um, economics. And there is so much money to so easily be made in building these three and four bedroom four and five bath, yucco stucco, 3.5 unit per acre McMansions, why would you build anything else? You can get money cheap. You can get money easy. The land is readily available to be uh, redesignated for that use. It is a quick return on your investment. It is a huge return on your investment. And it is a safe return on your investment. So if you are a real estate developer, why would you be contemplating something that has a slower return, a lower return, a higher interest rate, and a more difficult audience to work with? 50% of the homes in Sarasota County today are all cash purchases. And the higher you go up, once you get beyond $300,000, it's over 60%. Once you get up around $750,000, it's closer to 80% of the homes in Sarasota County are all cash purchases. If you're a real estate Broker, that's the development market that you want to be engaged in. So throwing them under the bus for doing something that is completely market driven, I think is a counterproductive argument to have. But here's the result. This is the byproduct of, of, of that market driven housing um, condition that I talk about. Um, I, I call it housing inequity. I don't, I don't really know how, to, on how to frame it. And I know this whole deal about um, you know, social inequity and, and income inequality, and I know all that's, those are buzzwords. I'm not trying to use buzzwords here. I just can't think of a more succinct and descriptive term other than, you, than to, to call it housing inequity, because that is what it is. Um, 
Sarasota County has a total of 100 and I'm going to use round numbers. If you want the exact numbers, I'll give you the exact numbers. I hate it. You know, they just drive me crazy because I can't remember them. Um, actually, it's 172,536. But Sarasota County has 173,000 housing units. They're called households, households in Sarasota County. <laughs> 20,000 of, of those households are, are at the po defined poverty level, federal poverty level. And they spend over 50% of their income for housing. Unsustainable. By any standard, unsustainable. Another 52,000 households in Sarasota County spend over 30% of their income for housing. All standards tell us that in these lower income brackets, if you are spending more than 30% percent of your income to housing, then you are making a conscious decision every month about what not to fund. You're either not going to fund health care, healthy and nutritious diet, education, transportation, or utilities. 30% of the households in Sarasota County are $400 away from losing the roof over their head today. That's not to say that they're going to be homeless but they will lose the place that they're in and they will be struggling for another place. Sarasota County, as a result of some of these numbers, has in excess of 1,000 homeless in our population today. Uh, just an unconscionable number for a community as affluent as our. Last year, we counted 953 homeless children in our school system. In our school system, that tells you that there's at least another 300 homeless children that are not of school age. That's over 1,000 homeless children, over 1,000 homeless adults. And there's no place for these folks to go. We talk about the economic recovery. If you do not have access to the economy, there is no economic recovery. And you are living in an unsustainable household, which leads to so many other social problems. I don't even want to, want to, want to, get, want to get into it. It has become such an issue in Sarasota County that it's no longer restricted to just being a moral issue. It is an economically and a socially unacceptable and unsustainable model. You can probably fix everything else that you're talking about in this room today. But if you have that many households cannot even afford a safe, habitable place to live in, you will not attain sustainability. The change needs to come by diversifying this housing portfolio mix. There's two ways. It's, it's a real simple formula. We know these numbers because we know what the income is and we know how much it costs to rent a home. Go to the newspaper, go to Craigslist, go anywhere you want and try to find a rental under $800 a month. Good luck. You're not going to find it, but that is the income bracket that these families must live under without making these critical choices, um, health care choices and others on, on, a, on a monthly basis. The most critical need for Sarasota County housing right now today is multifamily rental apartment units. We will never be able to build our way out of this with, with home ownership. Um, at least with the wages the way that they are, wages are stagnant or functionally declining for, for um, about 40% of Sarasota County's working families. Um, if you want to raise the wages, you know, that's, that's another quick way to get out of this because if you pay them more, trust me, the money is going to go back into the, into the housing and the economy, but there does not seem to be an appetite for it. So without increase in wages, the only thing that we can do is create the housing or subsidize the housing or we will pay the social costs down the road. So from my position, um, and, I, and, I, and I've seen Sarasota County from, from many, many different perspectives um, in the last 40 years, um, I cannot think of one that is going to be more pressing. And I'll tell you the reason that it's more pressing is every time we build another market rate house, every time, condominium, single family detached residential, you create a commensurate need for one of those affordable housings. So we stopped building them 15, 20 years ago, effectively, and we're not building them anymore, and every day we create the demand for more and more and more. This problem is exacerbating and it's gonna get a hell of a lot worse 
before it gets any better. If you think for a moment that the people purchasing, and it's nothing disparaging about them, this is just facts, if you think for a moment that they're going to be mowing their own lawns, cleaning their own pools, washing their own dishes, doing mopping the floors in the hospital, and all of these other tasks that we expect for people to do, and pay the less than $35,000 a year, you're in la-la land. They're not. They're going to demand more and more of these services, and we are building less and less of the households. It is in terms of social infrastructure and sustainability. I can't think of anything more pressing or anything that th threatens this community more than this downward spiral that we're on with, with in our housing market. So how's that for inspirational? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I have um, I have ten minutes for questions, right? Yeah. So we can. Um, I, I limited it to those three um, simply because that was um, obviously. I, if I were to go more, it would have just gotten confusing for me. Um, and so, do you want to do the cards or do you want to do hands? We we got cards. We got cards coming up. I'm not the MC. Cooper Levy Bakey is going to help me out here. So, um, the question is in Sarasota County, an accessory dwelling unit apparently has to also require impact fees. Would you recommend relief, uh, getting rid of that requirement for accessory dwelling units? No. It's against, the, it's against the law. The question was would you agree to get rid of the impact fee on accessory dwelling units? I don't want to get into all the details about this, um, but impact fee is a fee, it's not a tax. It is governed by the Supreme Court by something called the dual rational nexus test. The dual rational nexus test on a fee says that if you either benefit or if you create a need or demand for that fee, then you must pay your pro rata share of the infrastructure that's going to be required to um, uh, meet the need or the benefit of the of, of, of your dwelling unit. So roads, libraries, parks, blah, 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 blah. It is against the law for the government to carve out someone who benefits or creates a need. Reframe the question. Would I be in favor of having a, um, and this is one of the reasons that the county is looking at the mobility um, fee structure. A mobility fee structure, I mean, there's a lot of criticism because it deserves a lot of criticism because it's something that's easily abused, but it's also something that if used correctly is a remarkable tool because it will enable you to do just that sort of, of thing. You could have a tiered rate structure, you can have um, exemptions, and you can do a lot of other things that you cannot do with an impact fee because of the jurisprudence established by, by the Supreme Courts. There's a ways to get around it, but not through um, impact fee relief. So you would relief. say you're recommending going toward a mobility fee? No, I didn't say that either. <laughs> I just said it would provide you the mechanism to do it. Another thing that you could do is you could find a, 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 another uh, non-fungible funding source, such as sales tax or uh, general revenue, and can you, you can use it to subsidize the impact fee. But you cannot, use the sub, you cannot use the impact fee pool to subsidize the impact fee for any development unit that creates a need or benefit. Got it. Thank you. Anybody got cards? Cards? Got questions? Could walk around here. Let, let me get you through the mic. <laughs> John, our economy is pretty much based on uh, home building and tourism essentially low-wage service jobs being generated. Yet clean light industry, which could come to Florida, is discouraged because of the loss of land that used to be zoned for light industry has been changed. Sarasota has lost 3,000 acres of land that was formerly MEC, which would allow for light industry, to other uses. For instance, the new mall is a land that used to be zoned for light industry. Uh, what can be done to get more land zoned for MEC use and also to encourage the building of a modern R&D park? Because yeah, frankly, industrial wages are double that right. of service jobs. And, and, and my organization has spent a great deal of time in that space because we agree with you that you know these are 
um, employment opportunities for our youth that do not require a four-year um, college diploma. They will not go in debt. They could be immediately, within uh, a year and a half to two years, making fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 starting wages and then onward and upward um, from there. Let me, um, I did leave out what can you do. The same thing that can be done in this housing crisis is the same thing that can be done. Uh, he used a term called MEC. It's called a major employment center, um, which is just basically a place where people don't live, but they work in higher paying jobs to create goods, products, and services that hopefully will be exported out of this area, thus, thus adding revenues into this area that would not be here otherwise, as opposed to retail, which adds no economic growth to the area because you're going to buy food anyways. You're going to buy clothes anyways. But if you can sell food to someone outside of the area, then you have revenue coming in. And that's the definition of an export industry. And that's the definition of the jobs that Kevin is trying to, uh, to do. Elected officials are every day put under the pressure of people in this community not to do exactly what I said and what Kevin said. If someone were to propose a multi-story, two to three stories is all I'm talking about, um, nine unit to 14 unit per acre um, apartment building, or a major employment center uh, that would have light industrial uses. And all you got to do is use the term in industry, industrial, and people will come out of the woodwork because they associate industrial with smokestacks and pollution and noise. And you know, um, I visited most all of the light manufacturing places in Sarasota County. I, I would not hesitate to, to locate my home right behind them. Um, but the reality is, is that when they have these decisions to be made, only the naysayers are there. To make real change, if, if there's two ways to do it. Either the elected officials do it on their own, or we as a citizenry provide the framework and the foundation to give the elected officials something to work with. Because right now, if you propose one of these apartment complexes that I'm talking about, all you're going to get is we don't want that in our backyard. We don't want those people. We don't want that stinky industry. And until people from diverse interest groups, and, and, and somebody, I forget who it was that, that brought this proposal, you know you have success when you have housing advocates advocating for the environment, environmental advocates advocating for light industrial, and business sector, you get the picture? Instead of going, you know, if, if I go, I, I lobbied the county commission and the state legislature for decades on environmental issues. When they saw me walk into the room, they knew exactly what I was going to say. Or they didn't know exactly, but they knew what I was going to talk about. When I walked into their office and lobbied for something completely outside that area that I was known for, it made all the world of difference. And so until you get that diversity of stakeholders that lobbies these elected officials and speaks to them in, in, in the terms that I tried to describe today, that these are sound investments. Light industry, rental housing, these are investments in the community that will create situations where social services and non-export economic development down the road will cost us a fortune. It'll cost us 10 to 15 times more down the road. We can do it today, and we can save you know, the, the taxpayers a great deal of money. It's really hard, especially when you have term limits, and because the savings are secondary or tertiary, they're oftentimes accrued after that elected official makes that risky um, decision. They're really hard decisions to make. And until you put yourself in their shoes, or like myself, until you've been in those shoes and you recognize the difficulty of having a room full of people, such as these numbers are not unusual for a rezoning for an apartment building, um, and everybody's saying no, it's hard to say yes. But if this room full of people crowded the hall and every other speaker said, well, we understand, but where are they going to live? How can we force this family to choose between nutritious food, education, and health care in order to simply live in the community where they serve. They're hardworking people. They don't want a handout. They don't want the social services. They want a clean house in a safe neighborhood with good schools, period. That's what they want, nothing else. 
And until you know, we, we give the elected officials you know, th th this message that there's a community out there that what is it, network, we're mad as hell and we're not going to stand for it anymore, we're going to continue along the path of, of this decision making that is, again, unsustainable. This, you, you cannot build a sustainable community and not do the, this, this side of the equation. This is the human equation. Housing is the most expensive, uh, housing is the greatest expense that these, that these families have. Great. I think we've got time for one more question. Anybody have one final question, either written down or just want to stand up and ask? All right. Well, thank you very much, John. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Cooper. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, so next up is the interactive uh, portion of today's workshop. Uh, we're going to have our breakout discussion groups. Uh, we're going to share ideas on opportunities for next steps on how we can help grow and sustain a healthy, resilient, and prosperous community. Uh, so we're gonna have four different facilitated discussion groups. Uh, I'm gonna list them off. Um, so there's natural environment and water, that's one. Energy in the built environment, that's two. And then third one is social systems, which includes food, health, and social equity, that's third. And then fourth is sustainable economic development. Um, so in these small groups, uh, we hope that you guys have meaningful conversations that enable us to learn from each other and to identify next steps to work on uh, together over the coming year. Your goal is to develop action plans for making tangible progress on the ideas that you generate um, now and that we've generated over the past year. At each table, there's going to be a list of prioritized suggestions identified by stakeholders at events that have been held over the past year as opportunities for improvement. And with your group, you're going to pick one idea and then identify steps and stakeholders to make it a reality. Um, so pick a first topic. You'll have 35 minutes total at your first topic. Um, it could be something that you're currently working on or just are most interested in. And then at 35 minutes, uh, we'll change tables and you're going to work on developing an action plan for another topic that interests you. Um, and it's going to be one that's developed and implemented at the community level. So for it to move forward, there will need to be committed continued commitment and actions by you and others in the community. The role of county staff will only be to logistically support those groups of people who want to continue the conversations. And at each station that uh, you go to, there's going to be a sign-up sheet. So uh, make sure that everybody signs up so that we can get in touch with you again. Um, so look around at the tables. If everybody who, the different four tables, could you hold up a sign kind of showing where you're at? Can you guys spread out? Yeah, that'd be great. Lee Hayes, can you? I can't read it. <laughs> energy in the built environment is in the back corner there. Energy, okay. Christian? Health and social equity with Christian. Don will be foods. So pick uh, the first topic that you're either working on or most interested in, and then at 35 minutes we'll take a break and uh, switch up our tables.